Okay, folks, let's get started because we have a packed agenda. Please take a seat and remember to sign into the session via a link from the agenda or by scanning the QR code displayed in the room. All right, welcome to the first meeting of the CCWG. Uh, we've got a very packed agenda today, so as you can see, we've given ourselves a time or two. Uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, make sure that you've scanned the QR code that's up on the screen over there. Uh, and when you want to speak at the microphone, uh, you can press the raise hand button to join the queue, press it again to leave the queue. And similarly, if you are remote, um, you can do exactly the same thing, but also use the microphone icon to send audio and video if you choose. This is the IETF note well. These are the terms under which we participate here at the IETF. Please make sure that you've taken time to read it and we'll uh, make it speedy on through here. Also note that uh, in this working group and in the rest of the IETF, we participate under a code of conduct, which we take very seriously. Here's some helpful links, which you can click on later if you feel like. Uh, and this is our agenda for today. So as you can see, we've got a lot of awesome things to talk about. Uh, and first things first, we're going to talk through a little bit of how our charter is going and all of that. As a new working group, what are we actually going to be working on? Okay, so we had Richard volunteer to be our note taker, but I'm not seeing him. Maybe if we could have a backup note taker, anybody willing to be our note taker, please. Thank you. All right, so I um, so we wanted to quickly whoops recap um, our charter, which you can uh, parts of which you can see on screen here, just to make sure everyone's on the same page on what we're doing in this working group. So our congestion control working group will analyze some of the impediments to congestion control work and standardization in the IETF, and uh, we will be general general to all transport protocols, not just TCP or any other particular transport protocol. And this work will inform a revision of RFC 5033, which is also going to be our first agenda item after the chair slides. Um, so that is one thing we're doing. And then also CCWG is a natural venue to take on other work, um, specifically congestion control algorithms. And we are looking for two things to <clears throat> determine whether uh, a work item is in scope, mainly uh, empirical evidence of safety and stated intent to deploy um, by major implementations. So we are looking for proposals in this space and we're interested in adopting proposals in this space before or after we complete our primary deliverable 5033 biz. And then we will coordinate closely with other works doing relevant work in a space, uh, such as ICTRG, TCPM, QUIC, and TSBWG. And as I already said, we're going to be as transport agnostic, uh, protocol agnostic as possible. We do also uh, take algorithms proposed for experimental status. Um, and we are also potentially able to adopt uh, and publish informational RFCs analyzing uh, the published standard congestion control algorithms. And um, yeah, and these are our two milestones as already in shorter, but as I mentioned, we are uh, open to more work. Does anybody have any questions or comments on the current charter? Could I ask a question? I haven't get my laptop up yet. Um, I have a different um, document I would like to update in the BCPs on congestion control. 
do you think that might also possibly fall within Charter? It might. Uh, let's talk okay. more after your presentation. Thank you, Gori. And please remember to sign in to the working group session. We've heard anecdotal evidence of rooms being fuller and not everybody signed in virtually via the blue sheet. So please make sure you do so. And please make sure you use the cube feature to improve fairness among you know, participants. Um, just a few quick thoughts on GitHub. We did create a GitHub organization already, and we already put a few of our working group materials in uh, on GitHub. We're interested in using it for drafts as well. And uh, once we get substantial discussion on GitHub, we will make sure that A, we always confirm consensus on the mailing list, and B, uh, we will keep the mailing list updated on our GitHub activity using an automated updating um, mechanism, for example, sending a summary. So people who are not following GitHub all the time will still see what is going on, but we are interested in using GitHub to collaborate on documents. Uh, so just as a heads up. And if we don't have any other thoughts, we will be happy to already go into our next agenda item. If Martin would come up, please. So hot off the presses, I'm your new 5033bis editor. Um, I'm going to attempt to use bandwidth freed up from not being area director come March, which is a reminder for somebody, please run for transport area director. <laughs> All right. So um, as, as I, well, let's just go right into the slides. So this is the main deliverable. Um, I'm not the responsible AD for this working group. To be clear, Zahed is. Zahed is not here today, so I will be standing in should that become important. But uh, that is rife with conflicts because here I am as the main deliverable editor. Okay. So um, I think the first question is like, before I talk about issues, let's talk about adoption. Um, Richard, uh, who was the original editor of this, um, uh, basically copied 5033 into a new uh, GitHub draft and, um, and a 00 draft. Uh, there's like the boilerplate is updated, but other than that, there's like no substantive difference. And um, is this a good basis for adoption or do people want to blow away the whole thing and start with a whole different framework, of this document? Or does anyone really desperately need to see something in here before we adopt? And I'm happy to stop right now and, and see if people we have, have Christian. Uh, Christian. Thank you. Christian, would you come to the microphone? So, uh, I, I am yeah. trying to find my mouse on the screen because I'm a little guy and it goes away and then I can't find it. Anyhow, uh, Martin, I think. We, we had discussions before that, and uh, and you, you know that uh, we have had a lot of opinions exchange. Uh, one of the big issues in uh, 5033 is that some of the recommendations in 5033 are having negative effect on the internet, specifically buffer bloat. And so that makes me leery of uh, just taking a carbon copy. I think part of the exercise is find out which of those recommendations were wrong and uh, effectively correct that. Oh, I mean, so to be clear, if we adopted 5033 as this, as the baseline document, like we would clearly like examine every line of the text and like see if we wanted to change it. Um, uh, the question is this like a, is this, is this document format like correct? I, I mean, I think it's the real question or do we just really need a completely different editorial approach to what this document is doing? That would, that would imply like a completely new draft that started. Is it better to start from zero or is it better to start with this? I mean, uh, the, the good point of starting with this is that we have something to start with. Yes. <laughs> oh, so, 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 so like, right, there's sort of three alternatives. One is we start with this and we edit this. Number two is we start with an empty internet draft minus boilerplate that we start writing text for. 
And option three is that somebody comes up with some other beginning starting point, which I'm certainly not going to do. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that's that's the question that, that I'm trying I, to. Get I, I, I think I, I think I made my point to let those other people speak. Yes. Okay. Ian. Uh, Ian's about Google. Yeah, I I think you're not going to find someone else who's suddenly going to produce another alternate internet draft that's a better starting point than this. I think that mm -hmm. seems fantastical. I mean, if they want to, then. Um, we can consider that. Um, I think starting with something empty seems just a little bit too scorched earth. I don't. I, I have a difficult time believing that there isn't substance of value in an RFC uh, that admittedly has some flaws. So I would prefer to start with this because it's a thing, and then we can start actually making progress. And until we adopt something, we can't make any progress. Gory. Gory did press the button, but never mind. Um, I agree with Ian. Okay. So chairs, I don't know if you want to like take hands now or just go to the list or what. All right, let's do a quick show of hands to see who's actually in reach of their machine and awake. Um, so I think the question that we're going to ask here is, uh, should we take the existing 5033 um, BIS, which we've essentially just made this copy, and is there interest in adopting this as the starting point for the work that we're going to do as a working group, which we will then confirm. Can, can I interject yes. before we do that? Can we do yeah, an actual can. show of hands? Oh, no, no, wait, but let me finish. Can we do an actual show, physical show of hands? And like, yeah, have, people, have people skimmed 5033 and like know what it's about? <laughs> okay, so they know, they know what they're getting into. Great, thanks. Excellent. Let's note that in the minutes too. Um, all right. Uh, let's see, 5033 is a good starting point to adopt. Excellent. All right, we'll leave this open for another second. While we're waiting, does the does the dissenter want to articulate a, a viewpoint? All right, we will close this momentarily, and we are. Cool. All right. That appears to be 30 hands up for one hand not raised. OK, thank you. Um, we will have to confirm that on the list, but I'm going to assume that this gets adopted, and therefore, the rest of these slides are relevant. Um, all right, so there are a few issues uh, from Richard GitHub that, uh-oh, what did I just do? Did I do it right? OK, great. So uh, as as you probably figured out, Richard just stepped down as editor. Thank you for getting this, this ball um, rolling, and Gory and I have uh, have uh, stepped up to take it over. Um, there's a question of authorship here. Um, so, you know, in, 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 in keeping with general policy, we're going to try to just have some editors and then have some authors listed in the back. Um, you know, nobody's really written anything yet. So, but the way it seems like this is going to sketch out is Gory and I are going to edit this. And, and judging from some commitments, it looks like Matt Mathis and Christian are going to write a bunch of text and probably recognize authors in the back of the document. The somewhat more um, sensitive discussion is the original authors of this document, uh, Sally Floyd and Mark Allman. Um, uh, there's some ISG stuff that I could talk about here, but like uh, I will just make the, the case that I think it's presumptuous to um, attach Sally Floyd's name to this work. Uh, and since she's not able, the late Sally Floyd is not able to endorse it or not endorse it, it certainly she deserves to be acknowledged. Um, Mark is very much around. Um, I do not, from my experience, limited experience working with them, I don't expect them to be particularly responsive or even necessarily supportive of some of the things we're doing here. Um, so, uh, and we'll see what the diff of this document at the end, I think it'll be substantial. So I am going to propose that uh, barring further developments that they both be acknowledged and no longer listed as authors of this document. And does anyone have a problem with that? Say so now. Seeing general nods, but okay. nobody's diving for the microphone. Super, thank you. Okay. Um, the the other, I mean, there's some relatively simple editorial things I'm not going to bring up, but uh, concurrent multipath uh, is one one of the issues. 
um, that is not addressed in 5033 as it is today. Um, and like multipath is a terrible word that is a little overloaded in the transport space. But here we're talking about like multi not address migration to failure over actual like data simultaneously moving on multiple paths, which has this bottleneck sharing problem. And I, as I think most of you know, there's some experimental work in this area. Um, I don't know that we have anything like ITF consensus on how to solve some of these problems. Um, scheduling is a related thing, like on what path do I send this piece of data to, to uh, actually improve performance. This is another thing where I think there are no drafts or IRCs of note, uh, unless I'm mistaken. Um, do we think there should be in scope for this document? Do we know enough to say anything about what a cadastral control should do here? Or should we leave it out? Christian. I am all for leaving it out. Uh, basically because we have not, we don't have enough practice there. And it, I'm not sure we can say something useful at this point that is good enough to make a BCP. Okay, thank you, Christian. Uh, whoever's next in the queue. Sorry. Gory, and I kind of preface this by saying I'm only jumping up because nobody else did. So when you hear what I say, if you don't like it, come and jump up. Um, I think we should have it on our radar. I think we should be thinking about this as we write it. That doesn't mean we can make the recommendations now. But this is kind of like guidance for how people analyze this. So if we don't keep this in mind as we write this, then we're going to come up a cropper when people actually have those documents. So do you think we know enough to tell people how to think about these issues? We might know some of the points which they should look at, but okay. not enough to give a formula for how to right. get one adopted. I do want to emphasize that this problem is in scope for the working group. I'm asking specifically, should 5033 BIS address the subject at all? Yeah. The, the, the short answer is, I don't know, but we should think about it. OK, Ian. Uh, my inclination is we don't have enough information to really make a solid recommendation given this is, uh, yeah, so we should, okay. we should ask. And then Matt. Uh, yeah, my, I have a similar inclination. I would like to point out that the difference, the impact of the network is no worse than browsers opening multiple connections. And so it's sort of bound by that problem. I, I used to refer to this as small end cheating. <laughs> Thank you. He was clear. All right, here we go. Is that really high latency or is it did I not press the button? There we go. Okay. I think I skipped the slide. Did I? This thing. All right. Thank you. Did I did I go? All right. Uh right. So um well, you can see what this says. You can see I copied and pasted rather than trying to summarize it. Um, you know, there's the old textbook definition of fairness, which I think there's been a lot of interesting work recently about this. Do we want to reopen this and like redefine fairness in some way? Because I, I think fairness in some form will be in this document, one would imagine. So yes, open this, or are we happy with the old definition of fairness? Matt? You guys could sit closer to the mic if you're going to be standing oh. up a lot. <laughs> yeah, clearly I planned bad, badly. Um, so I would rather replace fairness by a notion of freedom from starvation. And fairness at low bandwidth makes sense, and it doesn't make sense at high bandwidth. OK, eliminating the concept altogether is, is a third option. Thank you. And I had to close the queue because we're short on time. Uh, Pretty much sorry. what Matt says. Uh, uh, I, I agree with Matt. We should not be focused entirely on fairness, and we should not have a goal to make sure that end players have the same bandwidth, etc. The non-starvation goal is fine. So, Gary, suggesting it goes in the other draft I'm going to present afterwards, and 
this is not really part of this because I agree with what Matt said on this. Okay, I think that I think the sense of these comments is just get rid of it entirely. Uh, yeah, but we, we might get a chance to talk more about fairness in this group. So. And by the way, Eric is trying to summarize this stuff in GitHub, which is very helpful. Thank you, Eric. In real time, I mean, I'm oh. impressed. So you're technically out there, of time okay, as there, the last slide. Go. Okay. All right, and then there are just three, um, one of these, well, I, I don't know if they're new concepts, but things that weren't addressed in, in 5033 BIS, um, buffer bloat, AQM, and then uh, obviously so slow, slow start existed back then, but you know everyone kind of did the same slow start. Uh, are these things that we should address? And I'll just open up the comments in any of the three. Yeah, please comment on the GitHub. Okay. And now, um, are we... yeah, sorry, we're, we're out of time for this one. Sorry, Christian, I shouldn't re I shouldn't have reopened the queue at this time. Uh... <laughs> Am I out of slides? I don't remember. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Can, can you unshare slides? Okay. okay, so next we have Yoshi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, my name is Yoshi. Today, I would like to talk about analysis for the difference between standard condition control scheme. Okay, just the next slide. Apparently, the thing isn't working. Thank you. Uh, let me start background of this document. So today, we have several condition control standards, such as TCP Reno, but Quick Reno, but Cubic. And then I personally believe that uh, condition control standard should provide a consistent guideline and it should not contradict each other. And also, I personally believe that when we apply one congestion control standard on a different transport protocol, such as TCP, WACUIC, or HTTP, uh, we should expect they behave uh, more or less equally because you know, they should behave based on the same congestion control principles. Uh, that's uh, but uh, as far as I check these standards, there are some you know, differences uh, in the diff standards. Uh, that's uh, one motivation I wrote this kind of draft. And then another motivation for me to write this kind of document is uh, basically analyzing impact of the congestion control on the internet is not a very easy task because internet is very huge, diverse, and also uh, deploying a congestion control standard takes sometimes, uh, usually takes years. And then, but uh, uh, having a, you know, describing the difference between congestion control standards may be uh, good information for future analysis of the impact of the congestion control on the internet. That's another motivation for me to write this kind of draft. And then, so what is in this draft? So basically, uh, my draft describes a list of differences on uh, certain topics in congestion control standards. Uh, the draft is mainly focusing on TCP Reno, defined in RFC 5681, and Quick Reno, uh, defined in RFC 9002, and Cubic, RFC, defined in RFC 9438. And so one point in this draft is you know uh, difference between uh, TCP Reno and the Quick Reno uh, because ideally uh, TCP Reno and the Quick Reno should not be dif different with in terms of aggressiveness. But uh, as far as I read the standards, there seems to be some differences. Uh, and then I try to you know list over some differences. And then another point of this draft is uh, uh, focusing on difference between Reno and the Cubic in terms of fairness. And of course, you know, uh, this doesn't mean uh, Cubic and Reno behave equally. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Cubic can achieve better performance than Reno. That's why we develop Cubic. And that's why we are going to develop Cubic as a standard. But uh, at the same time, Reno is also a uh, congestion control standard. So uh, Cubic should not push away Reno. So it, it should be have some balance between Cubic and Reno. And, but, uh, when we standardize uh, Cubic in TCPM working group, there are many discussions about the fairness between Cubic and Reno. So 
probably you know this kind of you know analysis takes you know require long term analysis but uh, uh, this draft basically captures uh, some discussion point on this point uh, from based on the previous discussion okay and then so let me describe some difference between tcp and the quick reno the first difference is initial window uh, in rfc 5681 uh, the initial window is defined as up to four segment or 4380 bytes. But in case of 902, uh, the initial window is defined is up to, as up to 10 segment or around 15,000 bytes. That means quick can utilize bigger initial, initial windows compared to TCP. And then also another difference is minimal RTO. Minimal RTO is defined in RFC 6922 in case of TCP, but uh, in this case, uh, minimal RTO is defined as one second. On the other hand, uh, in case of quick, uh, there is no minimum RTO, so you can choose any small mi uh, RTO if you want. And then loss window, loss window, by the way, is a windows congestion window size after you know retransmission timeout happens. And in 5681, loss window is one segment. But in RFC 902, uh, loss window is two segment. This might be you know, slight difference, but uh, because we have delayed al algorithms, this has some performance impact. Are you willing to take hands now? Oh, okay. We got two people in the queue. Okay. Maybe let's hear what VD has okay. to say. Okay. Um, it's good to... Hi, sorry, VD, yeah. Apple. Mm -hmm. It's good to highlight the differences, but what are we trying to do? Are we trying to tell quick developers, go change your congestion control to match 5681 or the or TCP developers to match 9002? Okay, so basically this draft you know, try to clarify the difference. I don't say this is bad or this is good. So, but uh, that goal of this document is to initialize discussion whether, you know, this whether this is acceptable or you know we can leave it or we should we should fix it in some way okay martin uh martin do google no hats um <clears throat> i think this present this analysis actually shows that we should update 5681 because i don't think anything in 9002 was controversial it's just just like newer mm -hmm. um and like quite frankly editorial energy to just do that in tcpm would be better spent than like trying to push to do this. I mean, this, I'm glad you did the analysis, but like to continue to progress this document, or just fix these fix, fixing 5681 is probably mm -hmm. like just fix 5681. If only somebody from TCPM could like do that, right. that'd be great. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I am also same feeling that's you no know, um, 5681 getting stale because you no know, internet is evolving. But uh, beforehand, this kind of discussion may take time. So beforehand, I would like to publish just different you know, other reference. That's my intention. Okay, Vidi, did you want to yeah. say something more? I want to quickly reply to what Martin said about that mm -hmm. 5681 is outdated and 9002 is, uh, doesn't have any issues. I think there is a small issue with when we do loss, uh, when we basically reduce congestion window after loss, um, it uses C win divided by, you know, basically does math on C win instead of bytes in flight. I think there's a little consideration there to basically look at um, that you're not using C wind when you're at the end of the tail. So you cannot just use C wind directly. I think 9002 does miss some of the things that uh, the window validation draft 7661 talks about. So it's not a clean answer that you should just do 9002. There are some details that are missing in 9002. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and then Michael. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm not arguing that 9002 is perfect. Um, uh, and if like this next thing like is is a further iteration of 9002, that's great. Just like there's just legacy stuff because 5681 is old, and let's just fix it rather than writing a lot about it. Thanks. Okay, Michael. Um, Michael Jackson, if we get, uh, if we try to synchronize uh, TCP and Quick, we should also synchronize SCDP too. Fair enough. Okay, so we, we have a minute and a half uh, of the 10 minutes left. We're already in an excellent discussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, then I will make it quick. So uh, there are some other differences, window growth in slow start. In case of our 9002, you know, congestion window can increase the amount of you know, arc byte. So if the arc acknowledges 10 segment, congestion window can be increased by 10 segment. But in case of DCT, it just, it, you can increase just one segment. So that's the difference. And slow start after packet, uh, slow start threshold after packet loss is also different. In case of uh, RFC 9002, it's half value of congestion window when packet loss is detected. But in case of 5681, it's half value of flight size instead of congestion window. And then also there are some text inside 5681. It's basically prohibit to use congestion window here. So it's somehow uh, these two standards uh, contradict each other to some extent on this point. And then uh, also I would, just to, would like to talk about the uh, difference between Dino and the cubic. And so, the big difference between Dino and the cubic is uh, multi table windows, uh, window decrease factor. And so this defines uh, how much congestion window reduced when we find packet loss. In case of 5681, this bar is 0 0.5, which means when we find packet loss, uh, we should reduce congestion window by half. But in case of cubic, uh, when we find packet loss, we should reduce congestion window just 30% only. Okay. And then this might not be very aggressive, but uh, it could be raise some kind of fairness issue. And then we have some discussion previously on the TCPM working group. So this draft basically captured that some discussion point. Okay. Yeah, so we're actually unfortunately out of time. Okay. I will take Martin and then we should move on. After 30 seconds of reflection of Vidi's and Michael's comments, like another way to go instead of 5681 bis is actually just, you know, do a trans a, a transport agnostic Reno congestion control document in CCWG since we're here. Um, so like, I don't know, whatever hero is going to step up and do this. Like, I, I think I'd, I'd personally be open to any of those avenues, um, especially if there are problems with 9002 and, you know, given SCTP, et cetera. So um, lots of space here for somebody to, to step up and, and, and be a hero. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's talk more about this at a later point. We're going to ask for two hours next time. <laughs> Sorry for the 90 minutes. We didn't know how much we would be getting, but now we're getting Gory next with uh, another DCP. Hi, I'm Gori. Uh, then what do I do? Press this. Okay, um, I'm Gori. Um, this one's been presented in TSBWG before. I promise never to present it again unless somebody offered to help me. Uh, Michael Veltzel, for some strange reason, said he would read it, which I counted as enthusiasm. And um, I'm going to talk about it here because I think it refer refers to this group. This is BCP41, which is congestion control principles. The problem is that when we offer the con congestion control can of worms, we end up with a lot of documents. This one is also quite old, and I've got some outrageous opinions to start with. So let's see. Um, number one, much of what we learned in the 90s is still relevant. Um, I think much of it is, not all of it is. Um, number two, uh, links, host, and routers are very different. Yeah, they're much faster and they do a lot more things. We run a lot more protocols. So I think that probably is also true. Maybe it's not outrageous. TCP provides safe operation for decades. What do we do next? Well, I think we, <laughs> ah. Yes. Well, they're different from each other and they're different from the 90s. <laughs> they're all different. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Okay, so um, seriously, um, my target is to try and replace or update 2914 which is the principles of congestion control. This might sound silly, but it might also be good because it would then give us language that we could use with the document that Martin presented. So um, I'm gonna motivate this a little bit further as to why we need to update. Uh, um, things have changed, yeah. Um, changes in the network. At one time, it was common that the serialization delay of a packet at the bottleneck formed a large proportion of the round trip time of a path. And I think that was common for many of these early specs from the 90s. And that really changes when we don't have that as the issue. 
So there's also changes in practice. We design things differently. We do congestion control slightly differently. We certainly design implementations very differently. So things are different. Right. Um, but the internet continues to be heterogeneous. There are parts of the internet which run very slow. There are parts which have very weird links. They are part of the internet because people who come to this meeting from various places around the world will experience these as the norm. Just because we see a certain type of network as norm, if we live in a particular area, it doesn't mean everyone else does. And somehow the IETF has to care about this. And this is probably a document in which we should make that care visible. So there's a need to react to congestion. I think most people would hopefully agree with that. We need to be tolerant to a diversity of path characteristics. And we need to kind of somehow tease out what that is because the original document um, talked about this, but not in the way we mentioned. And also there's a need to protect protocol mechanisms, which really wasn't there before. It was always assumed that the protocol did the thing and nobody would try and be the bad person to try and make your protocol break. That isn't the way we think anymore at the IETF. So when we think about congestion control, we have to think about bad players and actors also. Well, hopefully all that was relatively easy. So what's the big change I'm hoping for? This one. No, it's gone. <laughs> this one. Um, I, I think that the congestion control isn't one thing. I think congestion control is two things. Hopefully this is not contentious. I think congestion is a consequential side effect of multiplexing things. Uh, we need to adjust rate. We need to match the available capacity. I think all this is absolutely normal. We should see congestion in the internet. It's good to have congestion from time to time, and we adapt our rates accordingly. The thing we want to avoid is persistent congestion. And that takes multiple forms. It might just be full queues. It might be full queues where you start dropping control packets and the control plane starts going away. It could be regenerative retransmission. There are many ways in which that persistent congestion is something we should avoid. But previously, when we looked at this at the IETF, we haven't split these two things apart when we talked about guidelines for looking at congestion control. So this, I think, is my position I would like to put forward on this. If people hate this statement, that's fine. Please throw something now in my direction. If people like it, please put your hand up. If people want to talk, please just come and talk. And please make sure you enter the queue via oh. the data tracker. Bob, talk quickly. <laughs> Unlimited in time. Okay. Um, okay. Bob Briscoe, um, independent-ish. Uh, funded by Apple. So... Um, the, the point you made about uh, the um, effectively policing the situation, you know, um, enforcing things a bit, I would want to be very careful on that um, because I think we need some evidence that there's a problem before we do that because we could really break stuff if we try and fix things that aren't broken. Good. I like, tech. I like comments. It's fine. Question? So we, I, I am a bit worried that if we do two documents at the same time, 5043 bis and this one, you end up uh, having two simultaneous ways of saying almost the same thing, but not quite. And uh, I don't think that's a good outcome. There could be one recipe for that, because I seem to be volunteered potentially on both editorial teams. And I could purposefully avoid that if that is what the working group wants to do. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, you, you, fr frankly, I would rather see just one document, but I mean. Well, we should find out what the two documents mean. I take that as an important input. We, we really should be very clear about what the difference between these two documents is, apart from they're written in different decades. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, I want to throw out a crazy idea, which I don't expect people to agree with right away, but I'm putting out this idea for people to think about, and, and after they've slept on a bit, maybe we can discuss it again. Um, I think we should stop using the term congestion control because okay. it creates the wrong impression in many people's minds, and particularly the decision makers at companies who are the managers who are making decisions about how to build products. Uh, we need a better term. So one idea I have is, is the rate optimizer because 
when I talk to engineers who are building their own protocols over UDP, because they're smarter than Van Jacobson, and obviously they can do better than TCP in a weekend, um, they're building these protocols. And when I ask, what's your congestion control algorithm, they laugh at me like I'm irrelevant. Like, the internet doesn't have congestion right. anymore. They fixed the congestion. And their mental model is congestion is like cars on the road. It's a rare thing. It happens at rush hour. You fix it by making the road bigger. And a well-operated network should never have congestion. So congestion control is a thing from the 80s, right? We don't need that anymore. And uh, no, no, we, we in this room know that that's stupid. Uh, congestion is normal. Congestion, when we use it in the sense we mean, is the network is operating correctly. Yep, if I point one, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and point two is the thing that they, they were thinking of, which, yeah, having yeah. the same term for both, I get it. So I, if I send you one photograph on iMessage on my iPhone, uh, it should fill the network 100%, right? My, my bottleneck might be my Wi-Fi hop, it might be my cable modem upstream, but whatever that hop is, I should be using 100% of my share of that bottleneck because if I'm not, I could be going faster and then you should file a bug report because we're not doing our job. So it doesn't take a 1,000 football fans at a stadium to make the network congested. It takes one person sending one photograph or to be enough to saturate the network to 100%. And I feel like if we ask these people, you are saying what congestion control you have, you say, what rate optimizer do you have? Suddenly they can't be quite co so condescending and say, oh, it would be stupid to optimize my design. Nobody says that, right? You obviously want a rate optimizer because that's what we're doing. We're working out the fastest we can send to get the job done fastest or get the video conference with the highest visual quality, but no more than that because you can't go faster than the fastest, but you want to get as close to that as you can. So we need to reframe the discussion so people have a better intuition about it. I got it. Thanks. Next, Spencer. Spencer Dawkins. Um, I would invite the working group to think about names, uh, and Stuart suggested a very reasonable one. The thing I would like for the working group to think about first is uh, what he said that he was suggesting a name for. I think that is an important thing to do for the reason that he said. Uh, I think it's also an important thing to do because uh, when we are talking about uh, at least some of the media-related uh, protocols that, uh, that I'm spending time with, the we often talk about uh, we often talk about uh, rate adaptation and, and rate control and things like that. Um, and um, the, you know the, the, the characteristics of what you're shooting for are reasonably different. But I hope that that uh, those kinds of protocols also end up in scope for this uh, working group, especially since um, RMCAT has just closed down and uh, all of their protocols that they had put out were experimental. I believe they still are. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. And we have like two and a half minutes, so. Follow Stuart's point. Yes, people will optimize selfishly, but uh, there is one part of optimizing selfishly that makes life harder for everybody. Like if you are creating queues in joint resources and things like that. And uh, that kind of congestion is not desirable. It's not desirable to kick somebody else's packet out of the network. It's not desirable to impose a two second queue to another connection. So there's a limit to any kind of self uh, optimizing system. Okay, Matt Juras. Matt Juras Meta. Um... Don't rename things to not congestion control. Um, people that are laughing at you for s suggesting that can, you should they should congestion control will laugh at you no matter what you say. Um, so I would not optimize for those people and throw out you know decades of a what is relatively a good name. Um, to I wanted to actually echo Christian's point from earlier that I feel that more documents in this space is probably a bad thing. I would prefer to have fewer documents so that when it's not people, you don't have to be deeply involved to know what 
the different documents are saying. I think that's the state we're in right now is that we have a very long list of documents that all say different things and it causes a lot of confusion when people are working in this space. And so I would encourage people like Gory who are involved in both efforts to consider consolidation wherever possible and bias towards single documents rather than many numerous documents or guidelines. Thanks, Matt. Yes, I've heard Van Jacobson say in his own words, he regretted using the word congestion control because it's ambiguous. It's, it's used in different ways in different communities. So I, I give a double thumbs up for finding better language. Thanks, and now we're running out of time. How do you want to close us out, Gory? Yeah, I want to try and go through. Let's let's go quickly. Um, I've got through quite a few slides here in one. Um, these are the things that are in the draft that uh, has got my name against it. Uh, talking about these things because these things were mentioned in the principles of congestion control. They're a different sort of list to the set of Martin's list because these are principles for what to how this works underneath what you want to try and achieve and have a look at the draft if you want to understand what these are about. Can I have a quick show of hands who has read Gory's draft? Huh. We have one hand. Okay. Two. Two. All right, let's move on to our next presentation. So I guess I stop editing because um, I don't see people coming to me. So, um, Talk to me afterwards if you want to change it because I made the threat last time, but really I'm not going to carry on editing something that people don't want. And we can channel some of these excellent discussions hopefully into 53. Yes. Okay, we got Neil next with a BBR update. Hi, uh, I'm Neil Cardwell and I'm going to give a uh, quick update on uh, work on the BBR algorithm at uh, Google. This is with my uh, colleagues here at Google uh, listed on the slides. And um, yeah. So today I'd like to give just a quick update on some algorithm changes and then uh, give an overview of the current deployment status of BBR at Google. Talk about uh, the status of the code and uh, open source release plans um, as is usual, uh, we, you know, we're interested in any kind of uh, collaboration or feedback that people have uh, time to provide. So uh, today, one thing I want to talk about is the fact that um, we're making a number of changes in the BBR algorithm and mostly bug fixes and a few performance tuning changes. And uh, as part of that, we are updating the version number from version two to version three. Um, that's largely because the recent bug fixes um, uh, change the bandwidth and fairness convergence properties. And so a lot of the test results from previous uh, versions from version two uh, won't really apply to version three. So we mainly we just wanted to um, raise the visibility of this and make sure that folks reran tests uh, before uh, carrying over assertions about the version two behavior to uh, the version three algorithm. So that um, leaves us at a point where I'd like to just give a quick summary of the various version, BBR versions at this point, just to sort of clarify. Um, so BBR v1 is, is the version that we first talked about in sort of 2016, 2017. Um, and it, it uses bandwidth and RTT as the primary signals and uses loss a little bit over short time scales. Um, and we can think of this as sort of obsolete or, or deprecated at this point. Um, there's BBR version two, um, which is uh, evolved from BBR v1, and, but also is able to use ECN and loss as explicit signals. Um, and we talked, we've talked, we talked about that at previous IETFs, including some of the um, known bugs with that. Um, so BBR v3 is what I'll be talking about today, which is basically a, a small evolution of v2 with some bug fixes and performance tuning that I'll, I'll talk about today. Uh, and then there's a variant call, that we call BBR Swift, um, which we talked about, uh, I believe it was 2021, 20, um, which you can think of as basically um, BBR version three, but with using um, an estimated network RTT as the primary uh, congestion signal. And this is sort of for data center environments 
where you know a reasonable target RTT that you can use to decide if you think you're going too fast. Oops. <laughs> Why is it not advancing? There. Uh, all right, here we go. So BBR version three, um, the first bug fix I'll talk about today is a is basically a bug fix with the bandwidth conversion with uh, when you've got a lost or ECN signal that you've seen. Um, and the specific bug is that um, you can run into cases where after you see lost or ECN signals, uh, you set the, the parameter or variable that we call in-flight high, your estimated maximum volume of uh, data that's sensible to have in the network. Um, and then after you set that, your, your bandwidth probing uh, thereafter can, can stop early. And, um, uh, and this can cause you to stop your probing before your flow uh, uh, reaches its fair share of the, uh, the bandwidth on the bottleneck link. Um, and the root cause here is, is basically a somewhat subtle circular dependence that you have between the maximum bandwidth that you're willing to send at and then the maximum volume of in-flight data that you're willing to place in the network. And of course, those can both limit what you see from the network uh, in, in a sort of circular way. And as a result, this issue caused BBR v2 flows in some cases to not reach their fair share, competing either with themselves or with Reno or Cubic. Um, and then also it could cause flows to take a long time to, to reach full utilization. And the fix is basically to keep probing for bandwidth uh, until e either one of two things happens. Either one, you, um, your lost rate or your ECN mark rate exceeds your, your tolerance threshold, or you estimate that the, the bandwidth um, of the bottleneck link has been saturated. Um, and specifically, we mean here that in-flight high has not limited your sending behavior recently, and you estimate that the bandwidth has saturated using the same algorithm that um, BBR uses for deciding that the path is saturated in, in startup mode, uh, which is that if, um, if you've gone for more than three round trips without the bandwidth increasing by 25%, then uh, you estimate that you filled the pipe. Um, and of course, because this is a bug fix and prevents you from starving yourself in some cases, it means that in some cases you're using more bandwidth than you used to when you compete with Cubic and Reno. And so it necessarily affects the, the bandwidth share coexisting with those algorithms. So to just give a quick example of what, what the behavior looked like before the bug fix, you can see it on the top where you got four BBR flows, two starting at t equals zero seconds and two starting two seconds later. You can see they never really uh, converge. Um, after the bug fix, you get some um, you know, reasonable a level of convergence, or at least it's vastly better. Um, and then the second bug fix I wanted to, to talk about today was, was a case, was um, a bug where you could see bandwidth convergence problems when there is no uh, loss or ECN signal. Um, and that can happen in when you've got a sort of moderate to deep buffer um, where there is no loss and you, you know, no, there's no ECN signal available. And the, um, and the root causes of this failure to converge are, are that the, the approach of using a fixed CUN gain to calculate your CUN could prevent um, slow flows from raising their sending rate to actually effectively probe for more uh, bandwidth. And then the second aspect of the cause was that um, slow flows when they're using a lower gain uh, to uh, potentially drain packets from the bottleneck queue, um, the, the gain was actually too low and in many cases caused flows to yield too much bandwidth to the fast flows so that the fast flows kept believing that they had a higher fair share. And the, the end result of this was that um, you, could, you could fail to reach uh, fairness um, even within a set of BBRV2 flows uh, in, in deeper buffers. And the fix here has two parts. Um, part one is to is to actually increase your CUN gain to make sure when you're probing for bandwidth to make sure that you can put more packets in the network and and actually effectively probe for more bandwidth. And then the second part is to not quite slow down not slow down quite so much. Um, so instead of a, a lower pacing gain of 0.75, use 0.9, and that um, 
uh, basically arrives from the sort of, if you do the algebra um, do, with a simple model of, of what sort of value you need to make sure you can converge, that's kind of the number that, that falls out. Um, we have a question from Barak, yeah. I believe. Hi, I'm Barak Daphne. Um, question, you know, you talk about uh, the convergence of different flows starting at different uh, starting points. Um, can you share the assumptions on the fabric? Because I think from my experience, you know, it really depends on how you, for example, manage the buffers in your uh, fabric that may impact your convergence. Is there any consideration about it? Can you say what is kind of the queuing algorithm you were using or buffering algorithm you were using in the fabric? Um, so all of these uh, results that we're discussing here are just with simple FIFO queues with um, drop tail behavior. Um, um, all right, and so for the second bug fix, just to give you a sort of idea of um, what the behavior looked like before and after the bug fix, on the top we have an example of um, a, a, a similar test where we had two flows starting and then two flows entering later on, and you can see that they've sort of failed to, sh to converge to their fair shares. Uh, after the bug fix, there's sort of a more reasonable uh, convergence to the, toward uh, an approximate fair share. All right. Um, so those are the bug fixes I wanted to, to talk about briefly. And then the other um, aspects of um, BBRV3 are a couple minor performance tuning changes that we've made. Um, the first two are, are changing the gain values used in startup, um, both of the C1 gain, uh, reducing that one, and then reducing the pacing gain. Uh, and then we link to some sort of quick algebraic derivations um, that sort of explain the, the motivation for those changes. Um, and the, the nice thing is that they're both smaller values, and so it's, it's less, uh, you know, it's, it's gentler on the network, uh, reducing queuing and loss, uh, but also turns out to help uh, performance as well. Um, the, the third change is to um, tweak the algorithm that, or mechanism that we use when we exit startup uh, based on a congestion signal. And that one basically is saying, instead of setting in-flight high, based on the estimated P BDP, um, also uh, takes the max of that estimated BDP with the maximum number of packets that were delivered in the last uh, round trip. Um, and then finally, the, the fourth change is that um, the uh, exiting startup based on packet loss is triggered with a smaller number of uh, loss events uh, in a round trip. And basically, if you put all this together, then the, the nice thing is that the impact of all these changes is that you get lower queuing delays, uh, lower packet loss rates, um, and that turns out to help uh, latency for web-like traffic, for example, or RPC of traffic. So um, where are we in terms of deploying this stuff? Um, in our team has basically uh, deployed BBRV3 uh, for all of our internal WAN traffic within Google. Um, as we mentioned um, recently, BBR Swift is, is used within a data center. Um, and then for external traffic, that is traffic over the public internet, um, we are using BBRV3 as the congestion control for all the TCP traffic for uh, Google.com, uh, which we, you can think of as, as all of our sort of first party uh, web traffic that's not video streaming essentially. Uh, and then we're continuing to do A-B experiments uh, comparing V3 and V1 for a small percentage of users uh, for TCP traffic for YouTube and then for quick traffic on Google.com and, and YouTube. Um, so we're iterating to um, try to uh, launch BBRV3 for those traffic uh, types as well. So what is the, the sort of net impact of, of V3 versus V1 for these kinds of traffic? Uh, we're seeing a, um, a slight reduction in retransmit rates. Uh, we're seeing a slight latency improvement for uh, web search and also the start of video playbacks. Um, and it, as a whole, it seems like the latency wins stem from the, um, the reduction in loss rates, meaning that there's less loss recovery and, and faster loss recoveries. So um, uh, earlier today, we pushed uh, BBRv3, the TCP implementation, uh, to GitHub. Uh, and it's mainly the changes that we've discussed here in the presentation. 
Um, and this is, again, this is uh, dual licenses, GPL or BSD. You can use it under either one. Um, and then um, we plan to email these patches and try to get them into mainline Linux in the next um, month or so. Um, and the strategy here is that we're going to replace BBR v1 with v3 in place. So if you use the BBR module, you're going to get the newer version of the algorithm. And the motivation here is that um, we feel that this makes sense since um, v3 has better coexistence with Reno and Cubic. Uh, it has lower loss rates. It has lower latency for, for shorter web requests um, and RPCs, uh, all while maintaining throughput that's pretty similar to v1. Uh, it's sort of within the 1% realm uh, on YouTube testing. All right, so um, yeah, in summary, we, we've, um, we're open, we've open sourced a new version of BBR and we're using it uh, at scale at Google. Uh, and we uh, are planning on trying to get this into mainline Linux. And then after that, update the, the um, internet drafts to, to match that version of the algorithm. And um, as always, we're, um, we're, we'd love to get people's feedback and test results and, uh, and so forth. Uh, thank you very much. Um, any thank questions? you, Neil. We have six minutes for questions, and VD is first. Thank you, Neil. VD, um, I have two questions. Um, actually, the second question you already answered that you updated all the GitHub stuff. Right? My question is uh, in the first two bugs that you fixed, um, the general trend that I noticed is it's more aggressive in terms of the condition window gain and the pacing, or maybe during the probing bandwidth time, it's more aggressive than VBRV2. Did you measure latency for those changes and did it look like it went higher for those two flows that converged better? We, yeah, we did measure latency and latency seems to be sort of in the same ballpark because uh, the, um, the overall latency is sort of um, determined by that the average CUN gain of all the flows. And so the changes on, on the whole sort of mainly shifted the bandwidth distribution among the flows rather than changing the, the overall amount of queuing. Um, so you took away from the other two flows to give it to the flows that were slower. It was, I didn't see the y-axis. Yeah, exactly. The You're basically um, re taking bandwidth from the big guys to, to give them to the small guys, yeah. Okay. Um, I can try to dig up the RTT numbers if you're if you're interested, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Gori. Hi, Gori first. Um, great presentation, thanks ever so much. Are uh, you continuing this as an IRTF activity of presentations, or are you planning to actually submit the draft for publication? Um, we're open to discussion, I mean, or, or in suggestions. We, we don't have any particular um, uh, plans um, that are concrete at this time. Okay, it'd be useful to know your intentions in this so we know about other drafts that might depend upon this. So um, that'd be a useful conversation at some moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Roy. Hi, Rui Paulo, Apple. Um, does BBRV3 have any impact on L4S networks? I noticed that on GitHub there are some changes related to BBRV3, BBRV2 and L4S. Um, yeah, let's see. So at a high level, um, there are no sort of conceptual changes. We do have um, some implementation changes in terms of uh, some proposed patches for how the algorithm is um, enabled. Uh, with BBRV2, there was sort of a temporary uh, module parameter that we encourage people to use when they were doing experimentation with ECN. Uh, with BBRV3, our proposed um, uh, model for deploying this is kind of in, this, in the spirit of DCTCP. So with DCTCP, um, there was a facility where in Linux you could say, okay, with, for this particular route, I would like to use this particular congestion control algorithm. Um, and so that would give you a way to say, over this route, let's use DCTCP, which would give you a way, for example, if you have a machine where on one side of the machine, it's facing the public internet, and on the other side, it's sort of facing your internal network that is 
RFC 1918 private, for example. So you could basically create a route that says internally, I want to use DC TCP. Um, so we're thinking that um, for BBRB3, we need something similar in spirit, but different in the details because we would like the algorithm to be usable for both the public internet and internally. So the proposal here is to say that if you're deploying BBRB3, you would say you, you would create, you would use a, a new per route feature that we're um, offering where you could say over this route, I know that this is a, a low latency ECN environment and then um, the BBRV3 code basically looks for, A, does this TCP connection, uh, did it negotiate ECN support? And then B, does this route that it's using have uh, a feature attribute that says this is low latency ECN? And if so, it'll use the ECN functionality in BBRV3. Um, so that's kind of the proposed um, model. We're open to other suggestions if people have other ideas. Um, but that's, that's what the patch set does now. And there's a brief discussion of that in the README uh, uh, document. Okay, we have a minute. Christian is next. It's a simple question. Uh, I looked at your modification of startup. Uh, what I observe in my own measurements is that the BBR startup tends to be less efficient than uh, uh, I start. And the reason for that is that I start uh, exit starts up based on observation of the RTT, while uh, BBR tends to exit later. So I was wondering whether you have considered me using measurement of the RTT to exit startup sooner. Um, we have, yeah. I think that's something that um, could absolutely make sense. Um, we just haven't. Um, uh, had the t development uh, resources to, to experiment with that yet. But I think, um, you know, high start plus plus um, makes a lot of sense. And I, I would love to see um, people, you know, experiment with uh, using that kind of approach with, with BBR as well. Um, I agree that that can make a lot of sense. Okay, and Abhishek is last. Hi, Neil. Uh, Abhishek from Meta. Um, I saw the analytic derivation for the startup phase, even and pacing gains, but in the bug fix, when uh, the even gain was 2.25, is that backed by any analytic derivation or experimental? Yeah, that one is experimental. I think basically um, probably any value bigger than the, the sort of steady state value would work, and it's probably just sort of a, you know, a, the trade-off you would imagine where the bigger the value, uh, the faster you converge, but the more Q pressure you have, yeah. All right, thank you. And then we will hand it over to our next speaker. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Natalie is next. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Natalie Roma. I work for Deutsche Telekom, and this will be a short presentation about congestion control for DCCP. Okay, so uh, basically, during the last years, I've been done um, some, uh, some work related to congestion control for DCCP, uh, whose main application has been the multipath DCCP protocol. To give some context about uh, how congestion control is specified uh, for DCCP, basically every congestion control algorithm supported in DCCP has a congestion control identifier, CCID, and the specification of these uh, congestion control algorithms as RFCs are also called uh, CCID profiles. Um, basically, each CCID profile is based on existing TCP standardized congestion control algorithms. And at the moment, there are uh, three congestion control ID profiles for DCCP. Um, so basically, in these profiles, what is done is a, a reference to the existing TCP congestion control algorithm and also some uh, description of with what things have to be modified or adapted to work with DCCP. As I said, the, um, there are three condition control um, identifiers, uh, 
currently standardized for DCCP. They are the congestion control ID 2, 3, and 4. The CCID 2 uh, is a TCP-like congestion control algorithm. The CCID 3 is based on the TCP-friendly rate uh, congestion control. And the CCID 4 is um, an experimental RFC based on the TCP-friendly rate for a small packs. Now, as I said at the beginning, um, the main application of my work has been the multiple DCCP. So under this context, we saw the need of having additional congestion control uh, algorithms implemented. So we did implementations of VBR version 1, VBR version 2, and Cubic, um, implemented as CCID 5, uh, 6, and 7, respectively, for the Linux kernel. And these implementations are based on the TCP implementations in the Linux kernel. For the case of the VBR version 1, I even uh, presented some results in ICCRG like two years ago, if I'm not wrong. Good. So what I would like to do with this is to actually have um, new CCID profiles, which cover the newly uh, implemented congestion control algorithms for DCCP. That means to have an additional CCID profile for Cubic and additional CCID profile for VBR. I started uh, also two years ago an individual draft for the CCID profile uh, 5, which is our implementation for, BB, for uh, BBR version 1 for DCCP. I submitted this draft in ICCRG, but it is currently expired, mainly because I didn't know how to continue this work because there is no an standard uh, for BBR itself that can be referenced. So at this point, and the reason of this presentation is to actually get some feedback and how could I move forward with this work. So um, the first question is whether a CCID profile that is VBR based for DCCP uh, will require necessarily a VBR a standardized RFC. If not, uh, what are the alternatives? And also whether it will be possible to have a different CCID profiles for VBR version one and VBR a version two. And Related to the profile of the cubic uh, of the cubic congestion control algorithm, so the current RFC for qubit is informational, and I don't know if uh, having a CCID profile uh, that references this informational qubit RFC is also possible. So basically, that's it. Okay, we have Spencer in the queue. Spencer Dawkins, I would think that um, having a stable reference uh, would matter more than having an RFC. Uh, RFCs are good. Um, and um, we have talked about uh, not, we have, we have talked about not um, standardizing uh, congestion control mechanisms because um, you know they're they're uh, work in, work in progress uh, and have been for decades so for us to have an informational RFC that describes them that sounds you know perfectly fine to me and that's kind of what we've been doing unless something has changed dramatically recently Michael? Michael Turkson, um, having heard on his presentation, I would say um, do something for BBR v3, but not one or two. Um, <laughs> regarding your last point, in TCPM, we do have this document of Cubic, which is proposed, and so that should be out soonish. It's in the ROC editor. Okay. Do we have any more thoughts on this? Oh, we have Corey. Uh, Corey first, TSVWG, sure, hat on. Um, I think this is a TSVWG decision. The um, specification for DCCP says standard track required for specification of the protocol, which is a CCID. So I think we require standards track 
publication of the protocol spec for the C's for the congestion controller. And um, talk more there. Does that answer your question? Uh, then I have another question. So that means that if I want to uh, do this CCID profiles, I will have to submit the draft to the TSBWG. We could talk to our area director about whether he whether he believes that bit of work is transferred to another working group. But maintenance of DCCP is currently in TSVWG, and the CCID is a IANA registry that's controlled by TSVWG. So, at the moment, yes, but the rules will be the same anyway because it, the rules are specified in the RFC. Okay, and we have Martin. Since you put out the bat signal as responsible AD for TSVWG <laughs> and not for this working group. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, my, it's like registering DCCP code points is like a DCCP thing and probably should stay in TSVWG um, rather than be here. I would, that would be my interpretation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, if we're already clear on that, we can move on to our last presentation by Barack, I believe. Hello, um, so I'm here on behalf of uh, quite a big group of uh, people contributing to, sorry? Just get closer to the mic. Can you hear me now better? All right, thank you. Um, so I'm here um, on behalf of uh, quite a big group of people working on this topic for quite some time. Um, and basically we have come together from both um, kind of operators, data center operators, mostly perspective, and uh, vendors, and uh, we wanted to collaborate on this work. So um, the intention here is um, coming from the need for speed of cloud data centers. Um, and basically what we see is that um, we have way more data that we need to, we need to traverse the network. Um, that means we need to have um, uh, high performance uh, networks, and it serves storage, it serves compute, um, especially if we consider these days, and we have us, we had, sorry, also um, a side meeting about it, um, the growth of HPC and AI networks and their um, requirements, as well as a resource disaggregation uh, trend uh, in the data center. So all of these contribute to uh, the need for um, higher, um, higher speed networking. And um, apparently uh, what I think we see is that um, as we need higher and higher speeds in the network, um, we need to offload some of the things we use to do in software um, into hardware. Um, it's not a new trend, but I think this trend um, evolves and adding more and more layers um, of the stack. Uh, if in the past it used to be kind of a simple uh, mathematical operation offloads, uh, now we see more and more portions of the stack going towards um, how the offloads uh, is the only way to really scale the, the capacity of the networks today. Um, and because of that, we actually need uh, faster um, or better congestion control um, because everything reacts much faster. Um, the order of magnitude of the reaction uh, um, is, is much lower. Um, so it puts more uh, pressure in the network and we need to react to that um, in a better way. Uh, some challenges, um, uh, part of some congestion control suites uh, that are currently using or being used um, in high speed networks uh, is convergence. Um, so I think it was kind of discussed earlier. If everything is smooth, then everything is okay, but then sometimes different flows starting different times and we want to converge to a, uh, to a certain state and it's not that easy and we need it to happen very quickly. Um, we run multiple applications over converged networks. Um, that by itself uh, puts some new challenges. Um, and as most of you are well aware, especially in data centers, uh, queues and buffers are scarce. Um, as we scale out, uh, we need uh, bigger radixes. Um, and um, packing all of these together with bigger buffers and queues um, is a very big challenge. Uh, one more thing is to tune parameters. Um, I think it was discussed in the BBR talk as well, um, especially as we have different applications, different environments, 
um, tune parameters of some conjecture control suites is quite hard. Yeah. Okay. So I think what we wanted to uh, discuss here um, because of all of that is kind of a new approach, a new input into the congestion control scheme, congestion control suites, uh, which is based on inventory. telemetry. Uh, what we see in the market today is that um, many of the new networking ASICs have the capability to support inbound telemetry, which means basically as bucket traverse the networking devices, um, telemetry can uh, be put into the packets themselves. Um, and that can actually allow us a much more, a much richer and much more accurate signal from the network to be considered um, by the entity that will have or will implement the congestion control algorithm. Um, there are various efforts in the industry uh, that define uh, these kind of inbound telemetry models and operations. Uh, one of them is sitting here in the IETF, uh, part of IPTM. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, the IOAM term, and it's being included in different types of protocols. Uh, there are other um, efforts such as, as in the P4.org organization, um, which called INT and IFA uh, also has some drafts uh, as part of IPPM here uh, in IETF. And again, the idea is to utilize that, uh, uh, this new capability coming from the network to have a more precise and richer feedback to the congestion control. Um, and what we have done, we have currently um, two drafts um, that are available for review. Um, and basically we have the first draft that defines the algorithm of using telemetry information and in particular defines what um, kind of telemetry do we need from the network to be provided to the entity that controls the congestion. Uh, such as queue lengths, uh, trans transmitted bytes, timestamps, uh, link capacity, and so on. So this is part of the first draft. And the second draft, uh, currently the approach that we took is not to uh, decide on what is the actual format and what is the actual way to push the telemetry uh, into the packets traversing the network. Uh, because as we discussed, there are other efforts on that, in, including in the ITF. We want to build on top of that. We want to utilize this effort. Um, with that, we put a draft uh, more informational um, that will allow um, implementers um, to have some examples, references to how this can be done uh, based on, again, the current efforts um, across the industry. I'm gonna take questions now. Uh, yeah, sure. We have Craig in the queue, if you want to. Hi, uh, Greg Mirsky Erickson. So um, I have a question. Um, how critical you see that uh, telemetry information being collected in a data packet itself? How would you define a data packet? Uh, excuse me? How would you define a data packet? The packet that uh, really uh, triggers the collection of uh, telemetry. Uh, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question. Okay, I'll try to explain it. Uh, so in IAM, uh, defined the several methods of uh, collecting information. Mm -hmm. uh, the packet that we can uh, characterize as a trigger packet includes uh, descriptor of uh, information that's being request expected, right? So uh, some method in IAM allows to put this information in the trigger packet itself, mm -hmm. while another method uh, referred as IAM direct expert uh, basically leaves it to the local policy. And that can be either exporting raw data or aggregating data and exporting that uh, all over the management plane. Mm -hmm. So um, what you envision that your proposal requires and depends on exporting data, raw data in a packet that triggered the collection or aggregation uh, of some sorts and then analytics uh, of their uh, situation in the network, uh, okay. multiple flows. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Um, what we assumed here so far 
um, is that the packet that triggers the collection will carry the telemetry data um, forward uh, towards the receiver. Um, but um, you know, this is, I would guess, initial approach, um, or what we had in the draft so far. And I guess we would be more than glad to discuss uh, more ideas around that. I think the key um, contribution we want to make here is to introduce this new scope, this new input into congestion control algorithms um, and see how we, we can we together as a community um, build on top of these new capabilities that are available and how can we build better networks this way? Mm -hmm. Yes, because that's sort of a not in, intuitive that collecting information uh, in one place for the particular flow gives you a good understanding of overall situation in the network because obviously congestion in a particular uh, place probably uh, is caused by multiple flows, not one flow, right? Would you agree? Um, it could be. Could, could be yes and could be no, yeah. Right, so probably uh, aggregating this information for analytics when you can uh, see the bigger picture would be beneficial and preferable. Right, I, th I think the trade-off here is about reaction time. So as we discussed, a lot of the high-speed networks today um, assume hardware offloads for some of their operations. Um, if you will take this data into some collect remote collector and then try to push it back into the network, it may take a long time. Mm -hmm. But again, these are trade-offs, right? Yeah, uh, but one, again- but I, don't think, I don't think this is the right time uh, with the time that we have. Yeah, we to, only have- uh, To focus on that. We can minutes. definitely be happy to further discuss it with you. Okay. Thank you. We ha actually have four more people in the queue. We have, oh, okay. are you um, willing so to let, take let them? Try to go quickly. Yeah, let's, let's go we'll, quickly we'll to our slides. To, uh, yeah, okay. So basically, uh, I think we addressed, um, or we tried to address um, all the challenges we just discussed. So providing faster uh, convergence, um, since again, both the, sen the sender can have a very accurate understanding of the path and the current state um, of the path for a given flow that uh, can allow for a very precise uh, rate adjustment. Um, we can get to a, a near zero queue. Um, again, because we don't rely only on the queue itself, right? If one rely on the queue, it means queue is already, has already been built up uh, and we may want to prevent it. Um, and again, because of this uh, rich telemetry, we can reduce the amount of parameters uh, needed to be tuned. Um, I think this is a very important one uh, regarding uh, one of the initial talks here today. Uh, the way we look on HPC++ uh, uh, architecture is this is a service. It's not part of a specific uh, transport and it comes to potentially serve different transports uh, as well as potentially uh, routing engines. So some router, routing engines may also be interested in the state of the network um, so that might affect them as well. Additional work uh, that is currently being discussed is multi-queue considerations. Currently, we have been very focused on single queue case. Um, consider additional receiver feedback um, and extend uh, on encoding examples. With that, um, I would be very glad to discuss. Yeah, we have questions. two and a half minutes and Dimitri is first, then Jeff. Yeah, thanks. And it's a uh, most question. And I wanted to comment on previous question by Greg. Uh, it's really about reaction time uh, because in typical data center environment, you want to react on the order of few round trip times and round trip types in on the order of 10 microseconds. And basically that means you cannot aggregate. Uh, yeah, and uh, comment on HPC++. What I really like is that uh, this kind of uh, congestion control and, well, congestion information source uh, more or less allows to distinguish between congestion at the endpoint and congestion in the middle. Uh, because another thing which 
probably the best place to talk about that. Normally, when we are talking about transition control algorithm, uh, what we are trying to do, we are trying to influence pacing or rate or something like that, and that's it. But uh, modern large data centers are interesting environments, and in particular, usually have uh, a lot of alternative paths on the order of a few hundreds. So a uh, reasonable reaction could be try to adapt rate or try to influence um, entropy headers and just uh, move onto one of those hundreds as a path. And it's probably a good discussion for the future uh, just to provide congestion or, uh, control algorithm with some hook to for alternative reactions. And in this case, it's really useful to be able to distinguish between congestion and endpoint. In, in which case you probably want to reduce rate definitely. And congestion at the midpoint where both reducing rate and trying to move to another path on the network are reasonable reactions. Thanks. Thank you, Dean. Okay, we're almost out of time. We have Jeff. 20 seconds, Justin Sura. So uh, there's pretty large deployment of this technology already. It's not just a ITF work. And we've considered the speed to answer the great questions. Uh, once per RTT seems like a good speed. You could either do it through a separate probe or just impose INT header on top of existing data plane traffic. Uh, the relationship between real data plane and probes, probe would inherit same five tuple as data plane would use. So from behavior on the network, it follows exactly the same path, has exactly the same characteristics, real data plane. So when you receive an ACK, you can just react the same way you would do on data plane signal. Thanks, Jeff. Let's very quickly take our last question. And I'm also curious, who has read either of the drafts? If people would please raise their hand if they've read uh, any of the drafts. OK. Uh, all right, Altenai. Hi, I'm Altenai from Cisco Meraki. I'm wondering, did you uh, weigh the benefits of out-of-band telemetry before deciding on this approach? Because for the concerns that were mentioned earlier, like visibility, privacy, the MTU size, etc. I think we were quite focused on this current approach, but again, we'll be more than glad to discuss um, other respective approaches as well. Okay, great. I think we're out of time now. Thank you so much for Thank the presentation, and thanks everybody for the discussion. See you all in Prague. <laughs>